Pristine and rugged, these are the jagged peaks and tranquil hills of North Lake Tahoe, California. What once played host to the 1960 Winter Olympic Games has been transformed into a proving ground for some and a battlefield for the top echelon of the sport. For founder and CEO Joe DeSena, the Spartan World Championships is a dream realized, having witnessed firsthand the rapid growth in participation and athleticism that defines the event today. Thanks for coming. How many countries? 27. 27 countries. This is awesome. When we started in Vermont, uh, we barely had one country uh, involved. So it's pretty amazing that this thing has just taken over the world. Early days World Championship was Killington, Vermont. It was in our backyard. It was ice cold water. And it was mountains. It was tough. I remember wondering if the elite athletes were gonna make it to the finish line. We had Olympians coming out, quitting, collapsing, and crying. It was just the way I wanted it but it didn't have that global feel yet. We've come a long way, and every year just somehow seems to get even better. Spartan World Championships is unique in that it's the biggest international event on the calendar. It's one of the longest running, it's year seven, year four in Tahoe. The spectator numbers are increasing the participation numbers are capped, so you can only be 10,000 athletes. It's one place at one time of the year where everything comes together. Are you ready? For nearly a decade, the world's greatest athletes have gathered with a belief that you can never underestimate the heart of a champion. Official, Jonathan Alvin across the finish line. And although only a few have etched their names in the OCR history books, every Spartan that sets foot on a world championship course knows that the journey is the real reward. You know coming into Spartan Race World Champs that this is the most anticipated, the biggest race of the season. This is the race that matters. Races like this are so important because they really allow you to kind of see what you're made of. It's like one of those races that produces the most all-round athlete. It's like that caveman type fitness, you have to be fast, you have to be strong, you have to be flexible, adaptable. It defines the limit of the human spirit, because it's just this monumental task. You know that there's amazing athletes chomping at the bit to make their move. The competition now is ten times tougher than it was five years ago. It's deep, there's no room for error whatsoever, and people just don't have any weaknesses anymore. There are too many situations in life that are just really easy. I think putting yourself in these hard situations where you have to have those moments, you have to have those struggles, is important. You're suffering with a whole community, and you kind of get lifted up and shown that it is possible. The energy is unlike any race in the world. You have literally the best competition in the entire world at this one race. People don't realize how hard it is to say on this one day of the year that you're gonna come out and be 100%. It's so hard. That's what makes the World Championships so unique and so special and the guy who comes out is really the best in the world. 13 miles, 4,000 feet of elevation gain and 34 obstacles. With a stage now set, all eyes turn to the men and women that will face this arduous beast course. To the main stage right now, Spartan founder and CEO Joe DeSena. For Joe DeSena, a race of this caliber is an opportunity to showcase what many believe to be the world's greatest athletes. This is the men's and women's elite press conference. The athletes at the front of the pack, 
at a race like this are like no athletes in the world. Very, very stacked field to say the least. This is what you expect at a World Championships. I think like the adrenaline is so high for this race. There is no doubt in my mind obstacle racing will be an Olympic sport. We've already had Olympic committees come out. They've already looked at what we do. We know we have the eyeballs. We know we have the participants. There are a lot of sports in the Olympics that are, are this big. We are this big. We will become an Olympic sport, no doubt. What has changed is obviously the depth of the competition. Every year it gets better and better. My thought was, we want to get this in the Olympics. We're going to have to continue to make noise, to put challenges out there that seem impossible, to have tremendous purses on the line. That draws talent. So I say, you know what? We're going to put a million dollar purse out there. Anybody who could win Tahoe, Sparta, and Iceland, they're gonna get a million dollars, man or woman. This is an awesome moment for the sport of most yards. Spartan Race World Championships is absolutely brutal. Hey, this is everything that I've been working towards. You have literally the best competition in the entire world. You know you're gonna hurt and you know you're gonna suffer. It's so hard. This is what we work so hard for. This is what it's about. The strongest person, the strongest mindset, and the strongest soul will be the person who's the champion. This is the world championship. This is it. Runners are off. It's gonna be fast out of the game. This is a sport in which any one obstacle can change everything. He's on fire right now. I'm someone that gets excited anytime we're mentioned in sort of mainstream press. Good day, everyone. Welcome back to this week's episode of Obstacle Discourse. This week is a doozy. I was pleasantly surprised when I saw Spark next to the word million dollars no less than a dozen times. It's great for OCR because it brings in eyeballs. Top racers, I think they're excited. Anything that brings that much money and that much attention has got to get somebody super pumped. Is it impossible? Everyone is asking that question. Tahoe is the most looked forward to race all year. You've got to have a perfect day. And every year, the fields get deeper and deeper. Then we have this thing in Greece. It's a trifecta weekend. So Spartan has these three distances, short, middle, long. So now you have to do that all in one weekend. And then the third piece is Iceland. All right, do I need to repeat that? Iceland. It's a 24 hour race, period. To do that in pleasant temperatures would be hard. In cold, it's really, really hard. And you've got to do this race after you've already spent yourself all year. What are the course conditions going to be like? How many carries are they going to have to do? How many burpees are they going to have to do? All that is up in the air, but it is absolutely possible. Everything is impossible until somebody does it. The four minute mile was impossible. Same thing with Everest. Before people do something with regularity, it seems impossible. Thanks so much for watching. Enjoy. They say it always seems impossible until it's done. With a cool autumn breeze on their backs, Spartans begin to huddle near the start line. So as you can see, uh, the racers starting to gather here at Squaw Valley. Far from ancient Greece and the violent Iceland chill. Whispers, silent prayers, and the fire in the hearts of thousands begin to swell. Today we will crown a men and women's world champion. Creating an intensity for what will be the Super Bowl of obstacle course racing. Three-time world champion, put your hands together for Mr. Ryan Atkins. From Canada, it is the 2017 Spark World Champion. Put your hands together, Miss Lindsay Webster. Few dominate the sport quite like obstacle racing power couple Ryan Atkins and Lindsay Webster. And although they enter today's race and the race to a million as obvious favorites, they remain humble in the face of their competition 
and the daunting road ahead. To win, I think it'll come down to who wants it the most and who's willing to kind of suffer the most. We're about to kick off the elite beast here at the World Championship competition. Such a long and hard race it takes so much out of you in every sense of the word. 13 and a half miles, 4,200 elevation gain. One of the most challenging courses in Spartan history. Physically, you're just trashed, and mentally, you only really have a couple of those efforts in you every year. Please put your hands together, Miss Susana Popova! As the women's field has grown more and more competitive, it's sort of all come down to how you can do an obstacle half a second faster than somebody else. What chance to get this? Nicole, baby, miracle! Or how in your training you can eke out like 0.5% that's gonna give you like a little extra edge over your competitors. It keeps it really exciting, and I think that's how sport should be. To win here makes you probably the greatest champion in the sport. At the start line, about to commence. Orders, prepare for victory! Ha -hoo, ha -hoo, ha -hoo. Let's go! And we are off. It is the World Championships here in North Lake Tahoe. The lead field have taken to the course. Who will be the first to lead the charge up the steep climb? Robert Killian has taken lead already. Out of the gates, racers begin a massive ascent to the top of the mountain. Whether going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the elevation, obstacles or terrain, each World Championship course provides unique challenges and unexpected features, guaranteed to keep even the top echelon of the sport out of their comfort zones while battling for the title. My name is Steve Hammond and I'm course manager. The course manager is responsible for the overall layout of the course. Tahoe makes a perfect world championship course. The venue visually is unbelievable. It's epic. There's nothing like it. You get a close up and you see the Olympic rings. You got this little village, feels like a European hamlet. And then obstacles scattered throughout 13, 14 miles of course. It is the perfect venue for this race. World Championship races, we try and make it bigger. There's more people come in and we want to showcase the sport. This year's course that we've gone for uh, between 13 and 14 miles has uh, 4,200 feet of gain. And that's brutal. We've definitely gone heavy on some of the carries. This is horrible. We've gone for a very exciting battle. We want to see lead changes. We want to see athletes sort of fighting towards the finish. You have to kind of semi-pace yourself, but put yourself up there to win it. You've got to be effective over obstacles because it's a shorter, sharper race. It's going to be windy, it's going to be tough. The elements truly make it a world championship course. But what an incredible setting to have an incredible sport. Now two miles into today's course, 2015 world champ Robert Killian leads the elite men from a frigid swim straight into one of the most physically and mentally taxing obstacles the Bucket Brigade. For Spartans elite men and women, the mental demands of the sport are just as taxing as the physical. For OCR and Spartan specifically, the mental aspect is everything. You have to be able to visualize yourself being successful. One of the things I was dealing with in this season in 2018, early on, I felt this weird anxiety to win races. Like I felt like everybody was expecting me to do well and I would get to the point where I couldn't sleep. I would wake up, my heart rate would be like 140 in a dead sleep. My mind is getting so 
amped up and ready for the race that I feel like I'm racing even though I'm sleeping. Not a race like this, requires uh, a, a mental game that most people just don't have. Every step of the way, your mind is telling you, like, this is outrageous. Like, my legs are burning, my lungs are burning, my heart rate's at 200 beats per minute, I'm cold, I'm hungry, I'm just, I, I feel terrible. But there's something that just keeps you going. To be great at sport, you've got to be able to push through the tough times, not just in the training, but in the actual event. You're in pain and suffering for a long time. This is not a minute long swim. This is not a multi minute ski race. You've got to be able to redline, and not for a minute, not for 10 minutes, but for many hours. And everything that can go wrong will go wrong. The psychological push you need just to keep going during the race and keep giving it everything for that amount of time especially when there's so many things that put in your way just to make it so hard for you. It's not like you just have to put one foot in front of the other and you'll make it to the finish line. There's so much different stuff and it's really quite a painful experience. Out of the freezing cold lake water, Spartan's elite women begin to feel the effects of both the elements and the obstacles. The big question right now with the women approaching the bucket brigade, can the rest of the field stay in step? For Canadian Faye Stenning, Years of falling short of her world championship title dreams and the ever-increasing level of competition. Add an additional weight carried for the better part of the year leading up to Tahoe. That swim like just destroyed me. I just got so, so cold. I had a bunch of nerves going into this. I had left my friends and my family. It's so hard. It gets more competitive every year, and it's the things you need to do to remain at the top are just ridiculous. I'm having to take subways hours a day to find a like mountain and trails. I sleep in an altitude tent. Come on, push, 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 push. You're just doing these extreme things because you have to, because it's at that level of competition. don't do those things. Your sponsors aren't going to sign you, you're not going to make prize money, and then you're going to have to find a real job. Ray is there, Alyssa is there, Susanna Kotzenbover is there, and Rebecca Hammond from West Virginia is there as well. Like most sports, top-tier athletes vary in technique, both physical and mental. Finding another gear back there, so find yours. Now hot on the heels of Faye Stunning, Harvard med student Rebecca Hammond finds herself in a battle with race leaders, poised and resolute. Leading up to this race, I was a little bit anxious. For the past couple days, I was able to kind of like push it down. I didn't have my sights set on any place. I wasn't thinking about where I wanted to be. I was just, you know, ready to go. Rebecca Hammond looked like she was having a walk in the park at that point. We're seeing an amazing race as uh, the pack still very tight. And Lindsay Webster has worked her way in the first place. The defending world champion now leads the charge, but we'll try to get a good look on the rest of the pack, the battle for second, third, fourth, on to fifth. It's just interesting to see how many ladies coming into the spear are still going to be in the game. And that silhouette with the fantastic background is Miss Rebecca Hammond. So I am a full-time medical student right now. I'm in my final year, and so I'm doing elective rotations where I can kind of schedule them how I want. We have up to like five to six months to have like flexible. So that's been really key. Like I wouldn't have been able to do this in my third year. I spent July altitude training, then Arizona, Colorado, and then I came to California. So I've been able to spend this past uh, almost month at altitude, which has been cool. 
and there we see Lindsay Webster in first place, followed by Susanna Kotsamova, Faye Stenning, and oh yeah, the smiling med student from Harvard, Rebecca Hammond, still in the mix right there. With the majestic peaks of Tahoe as a backdrop, the elite women approach a world championship game changer, the spear throw. After an unforgiving climb to the mountain's peak, racers must now lower their heart rate and focus if they have any hopes of avoiding what has cost so many racers victories in the past. Ah! The spear throw was before the twister, and I was in the top pack of girls. Then um, I saw Lindsay make hers, I saw Susanna miss hers. People were missing their spears. Lindsay Webster just gave herself a gigantic lead heading down the mountain as Rebecca Hannon stepping up to the spear right now as the ability to steal away second place position. And I threw it, <laughs> my spear like hit the hay bale like that, sagged down and was like that far from the ground. I'm like, yes! Oh, are you kidding me? <laughs> She wow. threw that and just hung on enough to pass. And Rebecca Hammond is bombing down the hill. Yeah. I really was just looking at the ground in front of me and like, I'm just on a run. So now Rebecca Hammond, she'll move into second, chasing Lindsay Webster. In these races, I just try and like, smile and have a conversation when I'm running practically. Like I'll like crack jokes. I just try and treat it like a run. And that helps me focus. And when it's when I'm really digging deep, because I do, you know, I dig deep, it's 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 hard. This is not easy. I just look at the rocks in front of me, look around, like pay attention to the sounds and just try and be in that moment. And that really helps. And now the downhill, a chance for Lindsay Webster to gain some ground, but the question, can Rebecca Hammond pull her in? It's all intimidating, I guess, but this is such a new sport. There's so many moving parts to OCR racing that you just don't know what's gonna happen. It's not just about who's the fastest runner, who's the strongest. So uh, Robert Killian, he has started his descent, Alban in second, and Cody Moat rounding out the top three. Can the rest of the field stay in step? Seven miles in, race leaders begin to separate from the hungry herd behind them. For Army Captain Robert Killian, currently sitting in first place, today marks his third attempt at recapturing the title he claimed in 2015 when he shocked the obstacle course racing world as a relative unknown. When I won Spartan Race World Championships in 2015, I, I kind of took it for granted a little bit. I was like, oh, I can come back out you know, the next year and just continue to do this. He's coming right now into the A-frame cargo net. I think the past two years have really painted the picture of how hard it is. Spartan World Championships is probably one of the hardest endeavors out there. You're basically just playing a game of war. You're flipping cards and eventually you're going to have a stronger card than the other person. You slowly build yourself up or you slowly fall back in the pack. So this is where that grip strength and efficiency that he just used on the Tyrolean Traverse comes in. I kind of use the water to clean everything off. Unfortunately, that material wasn't absorbing the, the water like I thought it would, so I still had wet hands when I got to the tire. Now his hands are wet because they just came in on a hanger. They're gonna have to use what's called a pinch grip, which is a different technique with overlapping your hands on the backside of the tire. So I struggled a little bit on the side that was not facing the sun. Tried to get it again, couldn't quite get it. So I went down and looked for another couple tires, just wasting time. And I'm like, just pick a tire, commit to it. Here's the pinch and he's got it. Finally, you know, I just grabbed one. My hands were dry and it came up like no problem. Killian made a rookie mistake after the eight hanger. He put his hands in the water. The mountains, the carries, the incredibly talented athletes tear down the mind, it tears down the body, it tears down the soul. It's just gonna end up playing out how it plays out. If you notice John Alvin, he kept his hands up, he kept them dry. Strongest person, the strongest mindset, and the strongest soul will be the person who's the champion. Just with that, you saw Alvin close that gap, and it's one obstacle that can tip the scales that quickly. Hour, 26 minutes on the clock here at the World Championships. As they approach the tail end, just a handful of features left for the men to go. The gap closing with Killian, the rest of the pack. I saw Robert Killian just ahead of me and I thought, okay, I think I might try and go a bit faster. 
and did that probably about 10 times until I actually caught it. John Alvin has taken the lead in this race with Robert Killian for the first time in second place. Alvin had a little bit left in the tank when he got to the very top. Um, we were side by side, Atkins went right by me, and I knew at that point I had to try to turn it on and hang with those guys on the final descent. John Alvin made a move on that climb that we did not expect. Well, Alvin starting to make his track down to the bottom of here at Squaw Valley. You talk about the downhill abilities of Alvin, uh, one of the fastest. But the real story is Ryan Atkins and how fast he can run downhill. Right. We started sprinting at about 440 mile pace. Whoa, almost went down. And I was able to hang back um, maybe for 100 meters. And then I don't know what pace they were running, but they just left me. And here is John Alvin just hammering down this single track, coming down towards the vendor. Really, the downhill I started going really hard. And looking back, it wasn't even. It wasn't even Robert behind me, it was Ryan. And I know Ryan can descend like hell and he'll push himself all the way over the line. So had to go really hard right up until the finish line. Ryan Atkins right now is like a bowling ball coming down the mountain. He is flying after him. Two obstacles stand between Jonathan Alvin and a world championship title. Can he hold on? Can Atkins catch Alvin at this point? John jumps off, he holds his balance. This is the last one. This has to be textbook perfect. I think there's too much other stuff going on that, to, to get nervous in the final stages of a race like that. You're just fully focused and trying to push out every bit of energy you have. No mistakes can happen at this point. Atkins just behind him. Watch every single grab at this point. It has to be flawless. Alvin can feel Atkins breathing at this point. He's down. It is official. Jonathan Alvin across the finish line. Unbelievable finish. Atkins making his way across the multi rig. And as Killian approaches the bender, Ryan Atkins is exhausted. Tremendous effort as he's about to go back for the Rams. What a finish. Robert Killian, an absolutely heroic race. He's Have taking it in the moment with yeah. the fans right now. Robert Killian is the first person ever to place third or better in every single world championship that he's done. He earned it today. It wasn't a win, but he ran as good a race as he possibly could and left it all out there. That is another podium at the world championship. Robert Killian, valiant effort. He grabs third place. What a league of legends there. With the elite men's race decided, all eyes turn to the elite women. As Canadian superstar and 2017 world champ Lindsay Webster has stolen the lead. Unbelievable back and forth on the women's elite. As Lindsay Webster, Faye Stenny, uh, leading the charge on the women's side. I moved into the lead, uh, essentially at the spear and twister. Lindsay made her beautiful throw high. Basically half the girls failed their spear and then the other half of the girls failed their twister. Zuzana has missed and Faye has missed low as well. And so all of a sudden I was stuck in a position where I was just running by myself. So Lindsay Webster, as she works her way into the festival village here at the base of Squaw Valley, I kept telling myself, you know, you've done this lots of times before, so just hold on tight. Yes, 40 to 50 seconds okay. at least on that. Kind of threw a wrinkle in my plans because I never expected to be running alone. I assumed I would be in a pack right up until last climb. Right up, Webster just clearing the, the ape hanger, you can see, trying to shake it out, and she continues onward and forward. If you're not both mentally and physically prepared for it, it can be totally miserable. Lindsay Webster right now is overcoming the obstacles. It's a tremendous climb. She has not gone down to her knees yet. I think at one point I did spot Rebecca Hammond. Rebecca Hammond, a huge threat still to hit a podium this race. I've raced with Rebecca once before and I know that she's a really smart racer. 
and I know she's a pretty good downhill runner, and I know that Susanna is a better downhill runner than me. So at one point I was running, trying not to fry my legs, but still run it really fast. The defending world champion charging her way down this mountain. And I did look back and I could see her back there. Rebecca Hammond in second place. So I assumed that they were closing the gap on me. But now Rebecca Hammond is coming down to the last set of obstacles. Anything can change during an obstacle race at any point in time. That's the last feature, the Canadian. Tapping into a magical source of energy. For the defending world champion, she is now the 2018 world champion. There she is, Lindsay Webster. Today, Lindsay Webster was a story. It means a lot to me, to, like when I hear that people think I'm the most consistent racer of all time. As the defending champ, to cement yet another world title. It's to me, what makes a really good racer is consistency. Rebecca Hammond now is a name to be reckoned with. You are looking at Rebecca Hammond, second place here at the World Championships. You see a lot of athletes. In some races they're on the podium, other races they aren't in the top 15 or 20. It looks like Kosimova in third. If you're able to consistently make a podium, that just goes to show that you're like a really strong athlete. Susanna Kotobova, a two-time champion, with Lindsay Webster now the only consecutive champion, has finished on the podium in all four of her world championship It's incredible. Yes. People tell me that they think, you know, I'm the I'm most consistent and best in the world. It's, I mean, that that's huge to me. So it is official, our top three finishers on the women's elite field. Lindsay Webster, world champion. the Spartan World Champion of 2018. It is my honor to bring to the stage today's event winner, Jonathan Albon. Jonathan Albon from Great Britain, who is now, again, joins the group of two-time Spartan World Champions. There's not too many of them. Just shows his other dominance, commitment to staying fit, and just being a complete bad man. Is it okay if we just call him Sir John at this point? He's a two-time world champion. He's been knighted with that medal around his neck and that first place Spartan plaque. And just as importantly, a really, really big check that he gets to take home. It meant a lot to win my second world championships. It was a bit of a monkey on my shoulder to have won the Spartan world champs back in 2014. And then a lot of people did say I got lucky. No one knew who I was and I just turned up and somehow managed to win. To finally actually manage to win and do it at in Tahoe where it's at altitude, it was pretty satisfying. Now this leads into my next thought. It's time to think a little bit ahead. They won the world championship. They should be hopefully now booking a trip to Greece for the trifecta world championship in true Sparta. And then if they're able to win that, will they go to Iceland and nail that 100 miles that would win a million dollars pledged by Joe DeSena? The first time I really read about the Spartan Million Dollar Challenge was just thought, well, I've got no idea how to feel about that. But the first thing was you had to win the Spartan World Championships. So I knew that was going to be the hardest thing for me to do all year anyway. So there wasn't really much point in dwelling on uh, the Million Dollar Challenge until I'd won the Spartan World Championships. And, to be honest, I thought that was pretty unlikely, so I surprised myself today in the fact that I won and then actually realised that maybe there's a chance that I can go on to uh, win a million dollars. Obstacle racing seasons are quite long. Other sports will have four month race seasons, but obstacle racing, we started in February and we're not done until November. So I just knew that it wasn't going to be a realistic goal for me. I was ready for a break, so I made the decision not to go after it. Once I won in Tahoe, I actually didn't want to think about the Million Dollar Challenge whatsoever. I didn't want anyone to mention it to me. I just wanted to enjoy the fact that I'd actually won this race. Uh, but it wasn't long until I started thinking about the fact that you only live once. I'm the only one that can go on to do this challenge, so why not give it a crack? Press conference.
members of the first Trifecta World Championship in Sparta. Hey Spartan, back in the game today! 7,000 miles from the jagged peaks of Tahoe, California, sits the city of Sparta, Greece. For John Albin to win the million dollar prize purse, he will have to be the overall points champion across all three events this weekend. Only then can he set his sights on Iceland and the 100 mile Spartan Ultra World Championship race. For Spartan founder and CEO Joe DeSena, what started as a seemingly impossible athletic challenge to raise awareness for the sport has quickly become possible. And now he must come to terms with the fact that John Albin's historical accomplishment will cost him one million dollars. When I saw how fast John Albin ran Tahoe, somebody actually can do this. Somebody actually could win this million dollars. I'm like, all right, can he win Sparta? So in Sparta, you had to do a trifecta, you had to do a sprint, a super, and a beast. So I quickly put phone calls out there and said, send us the best athletes in the world to go up against John because we've got to stop him. Uh, this will be the largest event in the world uh, for us. And I know that if John Alvin wins the million dollars, he will cover the expense, so I'm excited about this. Okay. I'd be lying if I didn't say that my main motivator was the money because I'd already raced a lot in 2018 and I'd already been quite successful and I was kind of feeling like my body was ready for an off season. Martin, what is your profession? I like to try and take it quite seriously in the fact that I want to be racing for many years and I don't want to really push my body too far. But a million dollars, I mean that is pretty much a life changing amount of money. Um, it's hard to even think about. It would mean that I can pay off my, my house loan, I can pay off my wife's student debt, so we can live completely debt free. These are the best in the world. I feel bad, I'm hoping he doesn't win. I have a, mil I have a million dollars on the line. It was kind of a bit surreal in the fact that I was getting a lot more attention. Just excited to see what happens. There is pressure and people expect me to win and if I do get beaten it's almost surprising so it's kind of I don't want that to happen. I want to see everybody out there super excited. To be honest, when I when I went to Sparta, I expected to win. So it's a walking start from the from the arch into the park, and then we're starting there somewhere. I thought it was it suited me a lot more, and the athletes I was racing against, I was a lot more confident that I could beat them. Are you ready? Obviously, I had to perform over the weekend, but I figured I could do it. Look at this. Here we go. John Albert's put on the accelerator. I'm out on the course, and he loses the first race. And I think to myself, home run, he's not going to win. It was shocking to see that John Elvin came in third uh, for this part of the Super. Everybody expected him to win. First day, there's the Super first, and then the Sprint. I managed to beat myself up with two separate falls. It was incredible uh, when John took that spill. It looks very quick, but the damage was done very quickly as well. We were worried that he uh, couldn't complete the obstacles. Uh, he managed to, uh, to hold on though and uh, sort of battle through. Uh, and then of course, he uh, made a big, big statement yesterday afternoon and came back in first. This is a statement by UK's John Albin. He's going for gold here. He, he is not leaving anything yeah, John Albin is winning the sprint, that's for sure. The spot track to watch, I mean, it was, it, was, it was just like any other race. You turn up, you, you do your thing. This is history in the making, and it's also uh, just so entertaining to watch a, a, an athlete of his ability navigating such difficult obstacles with such ease. I think he's not going to win. And then somehow pulls out two wins, and he wins the weekend. And so he's still in the running now. For the million, not only in the running, but it looks like he's actually going to do this. John Albin, ladies and gentlemen, crossing the fire jump, spins around through the finish tape. He is the Spartan Trifecta World Champion of 2018. It wasn't so much a surprise when I walked away having won, but then it opened more doors to continuing with the challenge, so it was a little bit daunting. It's nice that I've managed to stay ahead of that curve and continue winning. To go back and win at the Trifecta World Championships, that boosted my confidence quite a lot. But I knew the next race to come was going to be a completely different challenge, way different to any other race I've done earlier in that year. 
and way different to any Spartan race I've, I've done before as well. greatest obstacle racers in the world. This guy, uh, he's tough to beat. He's like a chess player. He's a really smart guy. He never shows all his cards. I don't always know what's going on in there, in his head. Watch him come up through the ranks, and for whatever reason, this is the year where he's putting the hammer down. I think actually, to be honest, my first running event was an obstacle race. So it's actually how I got into training and being a, an athlete. I think I really gravitated towards it because I really like the type of fitness. It's not just running, it's not just strength, it's really like this all round type of fitness, which is it's really fun to train for. And also it's kind of how I want my body to be. My season is split into two, it's the, the racing season, the training season. In the winters when I'm training most and racing least. I do a lot of skiing, a lot of cross training, and then in the summer it's a lot more running training, a lot more specific training for the events I'll be doing. For some reason I've just naturally been okay at running or a good runner and then I've had enough strength to be able to do the obstacles. I think I've been obstacle racing for a little while now so I've grown with the sport so as the sport's got harder and more competitive and the, you know, the sport's developed I've developed as an athlete and I've tried to stay ahead of that curve. I'm a full-time athlete but I've got a part-time job. Apart from that I'm training pretty much every day. My season split into two. You've got sky running and obstacle racing. Sky racing is like a really extreme form of mountain running. So this is like a big wild mountain, go up to the top and go down again normally, or you can have places where if you fall off, you die. It's scrambling, running, hiking, like a whole combination. So it's a really, really fun form of racing and running. Sky running is really good preparation for the Spartan World Championships. I think over the last years I've become more and more competitive as people expect me to win more and I, I want to keep winning. Whereas back when I started racing I was literally just doing it because I enjoyed training and I enjoyed the races and I just wanted to push myself as hard as I could go. I think I'm also a little bit competitive but just because I don't want other people to win. It's not so much that I want to win, I just don't want them to win. Big results require big ambitions. Few know the challenges of the Spartan Ultra Beast as well as 2015 world champion Robert Killian. Although he has decided to sit out this year's Ultra Championships, he is well aware of the daunting task at hand. What you're essentially doing is two laps of the Beast Race. And they also, in addition to that, add some extra mileage. A lot of people really love doing you know these endurance challenges it's one thing to go out there and do a really fast lap but there's so much more that goes into an ultra preparation wise mentally and they're just grueling as if a 100 mile trek into the unknown and the potential life-changing prize purse of one million dollars weren't a heavy enough load to bear John Albin arrives in Iceland worn from the physical and mentally taxing championship season and the unexpected qualifying event needed to compete in this final race of the year. Last weekend I took a quick trip to Malaysia to qualify to race in this, this event so I wasn't officially qualified. In order to do so I had to complete a Spartan Ultra race. 
uh, in the last year, I think. So I chose the race that was one weekend before this one somewhat stupidly. It's raining, so this is going to be fun. We like running in a hot shower, I think. I think it's going to be really fun, actually. I've never done a race down here, so it'll be pretty cool. Loads of really excited looking people, so just sort of absorb the atmosphere and have fun. I don't think many races would plan to do an ultra the weekend before the Ultra World Championship. To go to Malaysia and be practically in a jungle and do a lot of sweating as I made my way around the 55 kilometer Spartan race course. The weekend before I was then going to go to Iceland where I'd be dealing with ice, snow and minus degrees. 24 hours, it was kind of a big shock to the body. So I'm here in Iceland and I'm getting ready to run my final race of the year, the Spahn Ultra World Championships, the 24 hour race. Well, I had to do I think between 14 and 15 laps to get the 100 miles and if I won and ran 100 miles then the million dollars would be mine. I'm really looking forward to just being done. I mean psychologically I've raced so much this year and I'm just going to be done. We welcome you guys out here to the 2018 Iceland Ultra World Championships. I think running any 24 hour race takes an extreme amount of physical um, energy as well as like mental. Uh, it's really psychological, so just to keep moving for the amount of time and also keep moving at a pace fast enough to do 100 miles, it's, it's going to be a pretty big ask. I mean, Everybody stand up. Touch each other, guys. Come on. I know I've done events like this before, but different terrain, different obstacles, different time of year, different weather. I mean, there's a lot of unknowns out there and I'm just going to have to take it one lap at a time. Being prepared for the, the unexpected is uh, good. The entire race is just a big string of unexpected events. You just deal with them as they come. Whereas if you've got a game plan and you turn up and you've got an idea with how you think the race is going to go, it's not going to turn out that way. And 90% of the time, things go completely able in an obstacle race and you've just got to deal with uh, the outcomes. I think I've kind of almost managed to put the million dollars out of my mind by now. A lot of people have been asking me questions about it, but I still can't really fathom that amount of money. So uh, I'm just going to go into the race. It's a very long race. I think it's going to take a lot of energy and a lot of concentration. So concentrate on, on that and see how it goes. With Tahoe and Sparta now etched in the history books, John must do his best to remain calm and resolute as he prepares to attempt what many consider impossible. Two qualities shared with a man guaranteed to give John a run for his money as he's done in countless races in the past, OCR superstar Ryan Atkins. I've raced John a fair bit. He's a great runner, especially on this kind of terrain. There's been a lot of talk about 100 miles, but I think what anyone can reasonably expect from themselves is just put down the best performance that they can on that day. And so that's what I'm looking for. What an epic venue that we have here in, uh, in Iceland. And the course is uh, it's, uh, 6.5 uh, miles and uh, crazy terrain. Definitely got everything on the uh, mandatory kit there, so that's kind of an important thing. Just still don't know what gloves to use. I don't think anyone does, to be honest. So it'll be fun to see on the first lap who's got the, the choice right. <laughs> so the terrain is probably the biggest obstacle itself. Um, they'll be running over rocks, they'll be running over sort of these moss through rivers, but uh, it's unrelenting. On the start line, you get a big mix of different emotions. You have this feeling that you're about to ask your body to do something exceptionally painful. Almost in two different halves. You've got the sort of the mountainside, um, and then you've got sort of almost old school central. 
So uh, on the mountain, there's a long couple of mile section where they're going to be up and in, in amongst the uh, uh, the mountainous terrain, which is, uh, we had waist deep snow yesterday. That's kind of consolidated. We had some rain last night and then it froze. You're almost sorry for your body that you're about to put it through what you're about to put it through. So you know you're probably in a really good shape and your body's in a good place and you're ready to race, but in 24 hours time, it's going to be completely the opposite. So you're going to swing from being completely healthy and fit to being completely broken. The conditions are um, pretty horrendous, but um, uh, which makes it for a very epic event. <laughs> My entire career, if you will, ever since I started running, everything has come together, what I've done, uh, how I started training and moved to Norway and all these sort of like pieces seem to be coming together to really suit a race like this and then even how this year worked out that randomly I managed to get myself in this situation to be here and be in the chance of doing it. If fate is a thing hopefully it's teeing me up for a, a good result this weekend. part of any race for me is normally first half uh, because that's when I'm breaking my body down which is something I really don't like doing I like to I like to be strong I like to be healthy I don't really like to destroy it completely once I've actually broken my body down it's not as bad anymore because then you just continue going anyway and you're tired so you're tired but there will definitely be really dark points in the race when I just think kind of I've got a little bit of energy left I really want to stop it's really miserable and hopefully I've got the strength to just push through those and think about just taking the next step, getting to the next obstacle and knowing that many people have been in a much worse situation. Ground conditions in Iceland were some of the toughest to run on, to be honest. It was uh, a mixture of frozen and snowy mountainside and then coming down to kind of wet, boggy grass. It takes a lot of energy to run on it and it's really tough for your ankles and all your little muscles. So it's actually some of the toughest terrain I think you can run a race like that on. This is terrain that I'm more comfortable, more familiar with than these really hard, rocky baked trails, but can take more energy to run on, I think. Oh, yeah. uh, sun, it's a little bit kinder to you because it's a little bit softer underfoot, but then over 24 hours, you're gonna get pretty pounded. Just three hours into the 100-mile journey, Joe DeSena becomes increasingly concerned as the seemingly impossible task continues to seem more and more likely with John Elbin on pace. He's running way too fast. Let's go outside. Where's John? Drag it back. Take your time, John. It's not a race. It's only a million dollars. You said you don't need the money. Why don't you pace yourself? All right, we're we got a problem. It looks like the pace is going. He looks good, right? He looks healthy. There you go. All right, good. Yeah. Two hours and 45 minutes to the transition. And right. Do whatever. And burpees. Right. It's gonna burpees. Start, he's gonna start dropping. So it's gonna be tight. It's gonna be tight, but it's doable. Yeah. It's and you, got, and you got to assume, knowing him, knowing him first lap, he went easy. Yeah. Right? Um, I wonder if Atkins is going to pick up the pace with the pass run. Atkins, you need coffee or anything? Ryan, you want coffee? With what was once an impossible prize purse, Joe must rely on the one man who can stop John his longtime rival, Ryan Atkins. 
Ryan's an incredibly strong athlete who looks kind of bulky and heavy, but he can run incredibly fast. So whereas I'm a slightly stronger runner, maybe Ryan's a slightly stronger athlete. So sometimes the courses can really just decide which of us is going to have a better day. I think me and Ryan are just two athletes which seem most naturally suited to obstacle racing and we we are just pushing a little bit harder than a lot of the other athletes maybe, but we're also to the athletes which train in a completely different way to the other athletes. I don't think either of us train specifically for Spartan racing. We're both a little bit more all-round athletes which like to get out and just go out and train in nature and do rock climbing and mountain running. And that generally prepares us for the unknown. I think Ryan's definitely helped up to the up the competitiveness of obstacle racing and Spartan racing because he's a, he's definitely a competitive guy and he wants to win and he wants to make himself into a better athlete and that just generally makes everyone raise raise their game. I like races that are hard. I like having moments in a race when I kind of have to like look inside myself and say this is so hard and soul crushing and then to have that kind of internal struggle and like overcome it and then to keep racing and keep performing at your best uh, i find that's when you have the most meaningful like growth Forty two point two miles into the race john begins to fade it's Sunday morning, it's 3 a.m. and uh, the elites have been on course for about 14, 15 hours. What an epic first half of the course that we've had so far. The conditions have gone super icy, so the course has slowed down a considerable amount. Uh, we've still got a long way to go and I think that a lot of uh, things can happen. downhill got more and more dangerous. It started off with a little bit of snow so you could kind of fly down at quite a speed. And then when we came down a little bit lower, it was a really frozen ground. It made it really slick and really, really slippery. So to come down that mountain, even in daylight, was kind of dangerous. Uh, and then to think that you've been, you're gonna expect it to have been running for many, many hours and then fly down there at night was, uh, was pretty tough. Then all the boggy sections as well, they, they started off kind of boggy, but then by the time people had run on them so much, they turned to be really boggy and really wet. And getting continually wet, muddy feet during a challenge like this, over 24 hours, it's really, really tough on your, on your feet. The longer the race, the more things that will go wrong. Physically, you're just trashed for days or weeks afterwards. And I think mentally, you only really have a couple of those efforts, like, in you every year and so you have to kind of really be smart about when you're going to use them and expend that mental strength and energy. Stop by 12, anyway. I just slowly got more and more tired. really didn't nail my nutrition uh, after about nine or 10 hours. So my energy level started to go really down. Uh, instead of trying to like take a little break or manage it, I just stopped because by that point, I wasn't gonna make the million dollars and that was my main reason for being there. So I kind of lost my motivation to bother to keep going. No, I didn't have it in me. I mean, maybe I would have pushed on further if I was on pace and I would have kept like energy high and stuff. But I got tired. Oh my God. Uh, I wasn't going to make the million or the hundred miles, and I always said like before I started, I'm not going to make the hundred. I probably won't complete in 24 hours. And I got off pace. I tried to stick on pace for as long as possible, but literally, it's like three laps on pace properly. Uh, and then after that, it started to slow down. So. Um, yeah, I'm happy. It's been a really good year. Uh, kind of bummed to stop. Then also, it's pretty miserable out there. I've got a lot of a lot of kudos for anyone still out there because it's a really tough. 
this is tougher than like Tahoe Ultra, Ultra Beast, tougher than I've only done Malaysia Ultra Beast, no, it's tougher than that one. Brian was like, it's tougher than any Ultra Beast either. So tough? Yeah. Yeah. John Albion, unfortunately, got his, uh, um, he's got his six laps in, decided to uh, to call it quits, and uh, so no no more million dollars, but the uh, 100,000 is still up for grabs for Brian Atkins. He is out there, I actually just literally spoke to him, and uh, he's doing amazing. How is he feeling? Feeling good? I think he's all right. This, this is his thing. His time seems to be consistent. After a record breaking 82.2 miles, Ryan Atkins decides his body can last no longer. With a deep breath of the cold Icelandic air, he crosses the finish line one last time and is greeted with a hero's welcome. Oh, I'm shattered. Yeah, watch it. Oh. That last lap just crushed me. Yeah. Cold or just tired? Just like the 20 hours of pushing and pushing and pushing. Just like my body just collapsed. Got it. Was it uh, harder or easier you expected? Harder. Harder. It felt kind of strange actually to be done once I finally stopped in Iceland because it had been a two month journey since I won the Spartan World Championships. It was kind of a massive weight lifted off my shoulders. I was pretty proud of myself to get as far as I did within the challenge. I think I certainly learned that I can do a lot more racing than I thought. So much more than anyone would even conceive possible. It is official. Jonathan Alvin across the finish line. Here's the beast Spartan World Championships. I think this is really important because people love to try and find their boundaries and this is kind of like one of the ultimate ways they can do that. To see how far they can push themselves is great. People don't really have it that tough in their lives anymore, so they kind of need a reason to go out and push ourselves. I push myself to find my limits like anyone else, but then also I just know that maybe I can do a little bit more than other human beings. So it's kind of nice to really try and find where that limit is. So John, you can't blame him, right? Three championships in a short period of time, his body was exhausted, but Atkins proved, I believe, that it was possible. I think if we want to get this in the Olympics, we're going to have to continue to make noise, to put challenges out there that seem impossible, to break records, to have tremendous purses. That draws talent, that draws interest. I think we have to do this. You know, they tell me running 100 miles in Iceland, winning three world championships is not possible, but we know it's possible, and it will happen.